In July 2014, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi ascended the pulpit in the Nuri Mosque in Mosul and proclaimed himself the caliph or leader of the Muslim community throughout the world. The institution of the caliphate had existed since the death of Muhammad and at one time had ruled a broad swath of land from Spain all the way to South and Southeast Asia. But over time, the caliph, who once wielded supreme political and spiritual authority, saw his authority melt away by other challengers. And by the time that the Ottoman sultan claimed the title for himself, it was faded into nothing. And when Ataturk abolished the institution in the 1920s, the caliphate had really ceased to exist as an institution. Conservative Sunni Muslims around the world wanted to revive the institution because they saw and believed that the institution of the caliphate had to exist for them to uh, function properly as a Muslim community. So there were a series of conferences that were held throughout the Sunni Muslim world to try and restore the caliphate, but they never succeeded. They failed due to quarreling. Violent Sunni revolutionaries also tried to reestablish the caliphate, but many of them over time saw it as a distant dream. Their enemies were simply too powerful. It was not until the Islamic State last year proclaimed the return of the caliphate, the return of God's kingdom on earth, that anyone had made a credible or plausible claim to have refounded the institution. And today, it controls a broad swath of territory in Iraq and Syria and numbers some 8 million inhabitants who live under its rule. Baghdadi has the title of commander of the believers, the historical title of the caliphs. But early in his life, he was known simply as the believer. It was a nickname that was given to him by his family and childhood friends for two reasons. One is that he was known to be deeply pious. He spent most of his free time in prayer and contemplation of Islamic scripture and tradition. But he was also known for telling off other people when they weren't being religiously observant enough by his standards. His brother recounts that Baghdadi would come home from the mosque and chastise his brothers and sisters because they didn't conform to his ideal of proper Islamic behavior. Baghdadi's passion as a child and in his teenage years was the Quran particularly the recitation of the Quran, which is an art in the Muslim world. His father taught the recitation of the Quran to neighborhood school children, and Baghdadi picked up the craft and was known to have a beautiful voice and be an expert in the art. And it's a passion that he carried with him through his undergraduate and graduate career. He specialized in the study of the Quran and its recitation as an undergraduate, later for a master's degree, and then finally for a PhD in Quranic studies, which he received in 2007. The common story about Baghdadi is that he was a quiet religious scholar, and then the Americans invaded in 2003 and radicalized him. This isn't quite true. Baghdadi had radicalized himself well before the Americans invaded. While he was at school in Baghdad, he gravitated toward forms of Islam that were more and more conservative and that were more in line with his own urge to meddle in the religious affairs of other people. So by the time he was nearing the end of his graduate program, he had not just become an ultra-conservative Sunni Muslim, but he had also embraced jihadism. And it was the final end of this intellectual arc for him. He wanted to impose his vision of a just society 
on all of the Muslims around him, if force by need be. And it was the American invasion that provided the opportunity for him to live out and realize his vision. Baghdadi in 2003 helped found an insurgent organization. And in early 2004, he was detained by American forces. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And he ended up in Camp Bukha in southern Iraq, which was a hotbed for radicalization. Uh, Sunni jihadists were mixing with former members of Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist regime, networking with one another, and Baghdadi emerged as an important prayer leader and imam and teacher among the prisoners who gravitated towards him because of his superior religious knowledge. And the prison guards also noted that Baghdadi had a knack for negotiating between the various factions within the prison, moving easily between the former members of Saddam's regime and the other jihadists. And Baghdadi's skill at navigating between these factions and his religious knowledge and the respect that accrued to him because of it stood him well when he rose through the ranks of the Islamic State after its establishment in 2006. He was put in charge of the religious fairs in various provinces and ultimately rose to the position of uh, the supreme director of the religious affairs in all of the provinces. He also successfully navigated the cutthroat politics of the Islamic State's bureaucracy. It was divided between the Arab foreign fighters and the local fighters, and the Arabs were on top. They had founded the organization. Baghdadi, as an Iraqi, had an affinity with the other Iraqis in the organization, but he was also able to reach across the divide and work with the foreign fighters as well. And by the time that his predecessor was killed in 2010, Baghdadi rose to become the commander of the organization, the emir. And it was by virtue of his political talent and also because of his religious knowledge and his claim to descend from the Prophet Muhammad, which gave him a special aura of religious legitimacy. Baghdadi today commands a military that has bested some of the most capable militias and states surrounding the Islamic State. He rules over eight million people. He has finally been able to realize his dark hope and vision of forcing others to bend to his religious will. He is also a uniquely capable leader of an insurgent organization and a proto-state. He has religious credentials which are usually lacking among the top echelons of the leadership of these organizations. He has the lineage from the founder of Islam that gives him this special aura of legitimacy, but he is also a very savvy politician. He rose up through the cutthroat ranks of the Islamic State and oversaw its period of successful expansion. If he dies tomorrow, he will be very difficult to replace. There are people in the organization who possess some of these traits, but not all of them in the particular combination of Baghdadi. So his death will not only be a major symbolic blow to the organization, but it will also be a real blow to its program and its bureaucracy. If Baghdadi's life is a cautionary tale, if we are to take any lesson from it, I think it is this. We have to be very wary of creating the chaos that allows men like Baghdadi to thrive and flourish. We have to be very wary of invading states and destroying the social fabric and the political fabric in order to remove a tyrant because a worse tyrant can be waiting in the wings afterwards. Thank you very much. Bruce?